I realized when I sat down to write this talk that I've been lecturing in the science for so long. We use PowerPoints and slides and things like that. I don't know that I can give a 15 minute presentation without some sort of crutch. And I'm going to start with my very favorite quotation, which is from Niels Bohr, who was one of the fathers of quantum mechanics. And he said, you should never express yourself more clearly than you think. Um, so I'll try not to do that today. Um, what we're going to talk about, I hope, uh, is the, uh, the, the fact that science today is defined by materialism. And I don't mean money and trying to earn money, although that is part of it. What I mean is that uh, science is founded now on the principle that the only thing that really exists is energy and matter. And thanks to Einstein, we can now convert between the two with E equals mc squared. But we search for answers about how and not for answers about why. Okay. Um, for some, you could add God into that. So we have three things that exist. So you've got energy, matter, and God. And that will be part of the topic that we'll bring back in uh, later. Now, this is actually a relatively recent development. The scientific revolution, uh, the end of alchemy. Some people date it to 1800 when we, when we uh, really became firmly materialist. Some people might say 1900. Um, certainly by 1905, when Einstein wrote his famous paper on Brownian motion and really set um, firmly the idea that matter is made up of particles, inanimate particles, with, with emphasis on the inanimate part. Um, that was really dates the end or, or the beginning of, of nothing but materialism. And in fact, that's assumed now. And so if you read the New Zealand school curriculum, which I happen to be reading recently, um, uh, the particle nature of, of matter, the fact that matter is made up of particles, the fact that we have models to describe these things, it's all assumed in the New Zealand curriculum. Okay? They don't, there's no debate about that any longer, even though it's only really been about 100 years since that was really firmly established. Um, incidentally, the scientific method, which almost everybody, certainly in my university classes and probably in this room as well, could recite, you know, form a hypothesis, test your hypothesis, refine or reject your hypothesis, that's actually newer. So that you can attribute to Karl Popper, who was a, a philosopher. He only died in 1994. Um, so it's a bit strange to think of these things that are so dogmatically held now as being so fairly recent. It certainly was not always this way. Um, and it's fairly recently that we've removed animism from science. So, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit of the history of, of how this developed. Science developed kind of hand in hand with civilization. So for two and a half millennia, people have really been trying to understand how the world works, to control it in some sense, okay, but also to use it. And if you read the Ministry of, of what is it called, in Innovation and in Science now, if you read their literature, you know, science is seen as the in, in, engine of economic transformation, right? That's been true for a long time. Um, but in the past, it's been not just scientists, but also philosophers, priests, priestesses that have really engaged in this, trying to understand the world, trying to understand the universe, trying to understand the laws of the universe, um, and coming up with all sorts of interesting uh, ways to think about that. Um, Plato, for example, this is one of the quotations I've got. Wherefore also these kinds or elements occupied different places even before the universe was organized and generated out of them, before that time in truth, all these were in a, state of devoid, uh, in a state devoid of reason or measure. But when the work of setting in order this universe was being undertaken, fire and water and earth and air, although possessing some traces of their known nature, were not yet disposed as everything is likely to be in the absence of God. Okay, so the universe is created by God. He creates the elements. The elements themselves are still imbued with qualities that make them behave in the way that they do. Inasmuch as, this was, inasmuch as this was then their natural condition, God began by first making them out into shapes by means of forms and numbers. So Plato was very much um, a proponent of the idea of mathematics as the, as the language of nature and so forth. But it was still all the hand of God. And we'll come back to that in, in a little bit as well. Early science, hefty dose of the supernatural. You know, Alexander the Great would sacrifice things, goats and pigs and whatever farm animals he had around to see if it was a good day to invade Persia. Okay? This was part of science. This, was, this is how you decided whether it was going to rain or not. Zeus had thunderbolts. 
okay? This, there's a heavy, heavy dose of supernatural. And of course, we've got Aristotle with the four elements, and air, earth, fire, and water, which has come back, interestingly, in um, Nickelodeon series and so forth for children. Has anybody seen the Avatar series? Not, not the movie with the blue guys, but the Chinese, yeah. Anyway, so my students all know this. Um, uh, it was wrong, this four element theory, but Aristotle was so powerful of a guy that this prevailed for 2,000 years, this, this theory that, air, that there was air, earth, fire, and water. And what Aristotle really brought to that was the idea that these have special characteristics to them. They're warm, they're hot, they're moist, they're not. And that you can move these characteristics around from element to element. Now, I'm not going to give you like a thorough history because I don't have enough time. Um, but alchemy was really born in Alexandria in the Nile when, when Greek and Egypt came together um, at the city that was created in 300 BC-ish, 330, by Alexander the Great. And the Egyptians actually were, were, were scientists in a lot of ways. They had metallurgy. They had glass making. They, had, um, uh, they were ex expert dye makers and users and so forth. Okay? And then the Greeks came with their almost mysticism, these four element ideas. Um, and in, in some people would say that, that science took a step backwards. Because 600 years later, by 300 AD, alchemy was fir firmly established. And it was almost all mystical. So it was about turning things into gold, which was pure. Alchemical reasoning went along the lines of gold is malleable, it's yellow, and it's shiny. Therefore, we should use sulfur, which is yellow. Mercury, which is both shiny and a bit malleable, if you think about it, and, and, and other elements of that sort that they had, okay, they knew about some of those elements. And we should think about those elements in terms of, you know, iron is red and related to war, and gold is pure and related to man, and silver is pure but oxidizable, so that's more like woman, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and so, you know, they had characteristics that they brought to the chemistry that they were trying to do. And it was all very secretive and, again, very mystical. Um, 600, 700 AD, that's when um, the, the Arabic form of alchemy was really prominent. And in fact, alchemy is alchemy, the word is Arabic. Nobody really knows for sure what the chem part is. They think it means black earth, as in the earth around the Nile, but they're not sure. Um, uh, again, this is the idea is that you can change matter. The, Arabs were much more interested in the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life, um, and they really brought that into prominence. Alchemy moved to Europe, which is what we're going to focus on from now till the next, the end of five minutes or whatever it is. Um, and, and so around the 11th to 12th century is when you get European alchemy really coming to the fore. Now, I've asked Jess to put an alchemical view of science and the universe, right? Science is all about understanding the universe and how it works. This is from a, a, a famous Paracelsian physician, so I'm not going to talk at all about medicine, but one of the good things that alchemy did, in addition to all the laboratory work that it developed, was it changed medicine dramatically so that you had um, actual diagnoses and, yeah, that sort of thing. And Paracelsus was the guy that led that. But Dr. Flood, is um, an, a, a British, actually an English guy. 1617 is the date of this. So he's 1574 to 1637. This is from a treatise that he wrote um, entitled Utriesque Cosmi Maioris Skilliset et Minoris Metaphysica Physica Atque Technica Historia. So for those of you who can't get through my terrible Latin, Metaphysics and Physics and the Technical History of the Cosmoses, or the World, namely the Greater and the Lesser. And this diagram is um, loosely translated as the mirror of the whole of nature and the image of art. So this is everything, and it's all here. Everything. Every, you don't need those big textbooks, right? And if you look at this, what you see, so up here is God, and this is the Hebrew God. And uh, God is chained to Mother Nature. Okay, so that's Mother Nature, and notice she's squeezing out... <laughs> fertility onto the ground there out of her right breast, which I kind of like. And the rest of her naughty bits are covered up. Um, she's standing on, on the earth, but chained to her is man. Man is nature's ape. Now, this is before Darwin, by the way. This person is not trying to say that we evolved at all. We are nature's ape. And, you know, if you look closely, you'll see that what that man is doing is holding up the world with a measuring device. 
Okay, so this is what scientists do. We measure the world, but we're guided by nature, tied to nature, who's then tied to God. This has the four elements in it. Okay, so we've got water and earth over here and down here. Down here are air and fire. Okay, we've got all of the elements. We've got animals, vegetables, minerals, minerals and the liberal arts apparently are all linked in one. Um, and various um, sort of technical things in here. And if you, if you look around in, in the cosmos, of course, this is the cosmos. So this is one of those celestial sphere models of the universe. Out here at the, not fully outside, because out here are all the angels and things. But we've got the stars, OK? And then we've got the sun and the moon. So there's the sun shining on man and the moon shining on woman. And we've got um, uh, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those were all the planets that were known at the time. All of this is linked together. And you could spend a lot of time looking at this. Actually, I, I, I got this image from a rare book library in the United States. You can download his entire treatise now translated online. So if you just do a Google search for uh, Robert Flood and go to the Wikipedia site down at the bottom, you can get a PDF file of the whole thing. Um, it, you know, I give whole lectures on this diagram, but I'm not going to do that now. 